my name is Carla Frutero, and um, I want to thank, start off by thanking the organizers and also um, these panelists. And um, I'll be introducing everybody all at once in the order in which they're speaking. Um, and I have a little wrap ahead of time. Um, so this panel could also be called Animal Hapticities, since in so many ways the haptic, the adjective referring to touch, perception, proprioception, and the senses more broadly as transmitted or received bodily, is often associated with animality. On the one hand, the animal part of the human, and on the other, those who either do not rise to the level of the human or are other than human, depending on the ideology that is sweeping animality up into its embrace. Sight alone, going back to the Greek, makes us humanly superior and rational, as testified to by its metaphors, speculation, reflection, and all those metaphorized sight words that signify the so-called higher orders of cognition, such as the word vision itself. Animal, as we know, comes from the Latin anima, or breath, so I think there'll be some nice connections with the last panel, um, and by extension, soul. Animal is thus a property of all, all beings who breathe and mostly move. Scientifically speaking, it's eukaryotic life. Ever since Kafka's report to an academy where a humanized ape recounts the process of his humanization, there's been a submerged tradition of protest or resistance to what is understood as becoming human. I know it goes back a lot longer than this. I'll mention just two feminist instantiations. In Humanimal, a project for future children, Banu Kapil explores the literal convergence of human and other than human in the anguished and tortured process by which the orphaned wolf children fail colossally, tragically, to become human when subjected to the sometimes brutal domesticating techniques of psychoanalysis and empire. Likewise, in Karen Russell's St. Lucy's Home for Girls Raised by Wolves, Becoming a human Christian girl is the torturous work of forcibly disabling the collective and communicative haptics of wolf being and pack being in the production of Cartesian reason, language, and so-called civilization. Becoming human in the imperial racializing terms of these writers is loss, devastation, disablement, and debility. It is a maiming of the haptic, an affective mutation that produces crippling symptoms in its wake. It is also channeled through the other than human in each of these cases, through the non-humans that are called, um, not quite exactly, but more familiarly, animals. These are some recent imaginative critical feminist explorations and reconfigurations of old human-animal dualisms that valorize the former at the expense of the latter and yoke animality and the senses to inferior modes of being, whether human or not. They take up, as well, the long-standing tradition of associating the feminine human and the racial other with animality. And they suggest some lines of flight as well as some acts of sabotage. But ultimately, the stories I mentioned are tragic, stories of failed resistance to becoming human or becoming civilized. Human and animal are only two sides of what Dominic Pettman calls the cybernetic triangle, the third being the technical or technological. This side of the triangle is often regarded as an enhancement to the human in the name of a transhuman or suprahuman future, and also as, a pros as prosthetics to the human to supplement a capacity or to supplement for a deficiency. For a long time as well, this dimension has also been embodied and represented in woman, and understand that in quotes, the new technological human machine hybrid turns out to be female in some strange ways. 
and she has been conscripted to issue warnings about technology's treachery, even as she represents the superior prosthetic enhancements to the human in an as yet unrealized future. Examples abound, at least since the turn of the century in the Western tradition, Fritz Lang's Metropolis, the robot Maria, who also interestingly embodies both the hopes of the manager class to put down the resistance and, as it turns out, and, <clears throat> and as it turns out, embodies at the same time chaos and disorder and treachery. There's the Stepford Wives, there's Donna Haraway's Cyborg, and the movies recently, Ex Machina or Her, and, of course, Apple's Siri, and so many more. The panelists this afternoon, from different angles and in different genres and critical traditions, and also with different perspectives, all apply pressure to the human through animal and technical otherness and a human, inhuman, other than human, others, and their and our perceptual apparatuses. Debility, tragedy, brutality, sabotage, and resistance are properties or maybe modalities of haptic animality or animal hapticity beyond, beside, within, and re in relation to the human. Our first speaker is Joshua Bennett. The title of his talk is White Dogs. He's the author, or White Dogs, yes, plural. He's the author of The Sobbing School, and Being Property Once Myself, Blackness and the End of Man, forthcoming from Harvard University Press. He holds a PhD in English from Princeton University and an MA in Theater and Performance Studies from the University of Warwick, where he was a Marshall Scholar. Winner of the 2015 National Poetry Series, he has received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, Kawe Kanem, the Josephine de Carmen Fellowship Trust, and the Ford Foundation. His writing appears in the American Poetry Review, Boston Review, the New York Times, and Poetry, among others. He's currently a junior fellow in the Society of Fellows at Harvard University. Second will be Patricia Ticineto Cloth. Animality and, and technicity, sorry, the affective infrastructure of the haptic. Patricia Clough is professor of sociology and women's studies at the Graduate Center in Queens College of the City University of New York. Her books include Auto Affection, Unconscious Thought in the Age of Teletechnology, and as editor, The Affective Turn, Theorizing the Social and Beyond Biopolitics. Forthcoming is The User Unconscious, Essays on Affect, Media, and Computation. Her work has drawn on theoretical traditions concerned with technology, affect, unconscious processes, political economy, and experimental methods of research and presentation. She's also a psychoanalyst practicing in New York City. Jasbir Puar, a uh, post-human subalterns. Professor Puar is Associate Professor of Women and Gender Studies at Rutgers University. She's the author of Terrorist Assemblages, Homo Nationalism in Queer Times, winner of the Cultural Studies Book Award from the Association for Asian American Studies. Her forthcoming book, The Right to Maim, Debility, Capacity, Disability, coming from Duke University Press in 2017, addresses biopolitics, disability, and forms of active debilitation in the operations of war machines and racial capitalism. The book appears in a new series, Anima, which she co-edits with Mel Chen. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Joshua. Thank you. Thank you, Carla, for that generous introduction. How y'all doing? All right, cool, cool. Um, thank you to the organizers, uh, Che in particular, for the invite um, to all my friends and teachers and colleagues and former teachers here. Uh, in many ways, the current book project is an outgrowth of me doing some of my coursework across the street um, and taking a class with Saidiya Hartman on the afterlives of slavery, uh, in which you know, I had this whole project that was gonna be about you know, blackness and animality and um, about how black folks had kind of transcended humanity, you know, in, in the 19th century. And uh, Professor Hartman, as she does, 
uh, turned me back toward the archive. She took me to these WPA interviews in which time and time again, uh, recently emancipated black folks said, no, this is human flesh. Um, and so th those are the investments of the project. And it's uh, part of what I wanna talk about here today in this talk, White Dogs. So I begin with an epigraph from uh, one of my favorite lyric poets, uh, Earl Simmons, AKA DMX. <clears throat> Truth is, I trust dogs more than I trust humans. White dogs, and to be clear, when I use this phrase, I'm referring both to dogs that are phenotypically white, as well as dogs owned by white people, dogs whose flesh is employed and exploited toward the end of maintaining white racial domination are ubiquitous within the black aesthetic tradition and beyond. From the Carl Phillips poem, White Dog, to Colin Diane's recent monograph, The Law is a White Dog, to the Langston Hughes short story, Little Dog, which can be found in his 1934 collection, The Ways of White Folks, a tale wherein two of the central characters are a white woman, Miss Briggs, and her white dog, to the pack of bloodhounds that bound across the ice after Eliza and Uncle Tom's cabin, the trace of white dogs, it seems, can be found wherever one might turn or try to run. White dogs that are quite often not only pets, but extensions of the police state, indeed, the very flesh and blood entities through which the murderous whims of the police state are made manifest in the everyday lives of black people. And here we can think about the fairly famous images of police dogs being used against civil rights protesters and contemporary canine squads, but also something like the 2007 Michael Vick trial where public discourse around Vic called not only for his incarceration as a result of his role in an interstate dogfighting ring, but even in the case of Fox News correspondent Tucker Carlson, who asserted that Vic, quote, should have been executed, his death. And here I also wanna mention uh, Samuel Fuller's 1982 film, White Dog. I know folks are familiar. Um, it's about a phenotypically white dog that is trained by a white supremacist to murder black people uh, becomes a stray, right, very wild, uh, becomes a stray, is then adopted by a white woman who turns him over to a black dog trainer that trains him to not be racist. Um, it doesn't quite work out. <laughs> Given this implicit doubleness, that is the historical role of dogs as both deadly threats and dearest companions, how might we devise an approach to reading the presence of dogs in African-American letters that undermines the mythos which allows for them to be primarily and uncritically imagined as man's best friend? If the dog is indeed always and already the closest companion of man, then what happens in a textual moment or social scene in which man is jettisoned from our line of sight and we find ourselves in worlds imagined or otherwise populated by those who live and love at the edges of the genre of man? those altogether barred from that category and its varied protections. How might we work toward a theory of black kinship, black friendship as a way of life by paying close attention to literary moments in which black folks and the dogs with whom they share space are able to complicate and subvert the sensibilities which give shape and form to any strictly dominant relationship between non-human animal and human master subject. Alongside both Frantz Fanon's formulation that quote, the black is not a man, as well as Sylvia Winter's claim that the work of black feminism is, in one sense, a collective laboring toward the end of the genre of man, I would like to think about what kinship between humans and dogs can look like when that which grants coherence to the position of the former is something other than sovereignty. If we can imagine human-dog relationships outside of species hierarchy, then what sort of alternative models for thinking sociality might become available? Put differently, if we are willing to militate toward the abolition of the genre of man and think companionship anew outside the familiar terms which have structured the relationship between pet and master in the first instance, what rises to the fore in its wake? What beauty, what unthinkable terror? In the name of this pursuit, I will focus primarily on the role of dogs in Jesmyn Ward's 2011 novel, Salvage the Bones. Therein, I argue, we are provided with a foundation for theorizing kinship across species via the relationship between the novel's protagonist, Esh, her brother, Skeeta, and China, a white pit bull who also serves as the primary breadwinner in Esh and Skeeta's home. 
through this defamiliarizing gesture as well as others, including the recoding of dogfighting and the underground spaces in which dogfighting takes place as sites of both black social possibility and singular human non-human intimacy, Ward crafts a universe in which traditional taxonomies are raised to the ground in favor of a much more slippery, unregulated way of organizing human and non-human life. I'm interested in lingering with these moments of indeterminacy toward the end of imagining, alongside Ward, a more liberating model of interspecies companionship and collaboration, right? So the moment the reader arrives in the world of Salvage the Bones, we are informed that China, Ashton Skeeda's animal companion, as well as a new mother to a litter of five, has served as a central authority figure in their household for some time. A role she enters, we are led to believe, once Eshin Skeeda's father fades to the background in the wake of their own mother's unexpected death. Thus, when Esh describes her brother in China at the beginning of the novel as, quote, a pair of proud parents, it is a gesture, I think, towards the sort of anti-normative, distinctly wild kinship relations that have emerged in the absence of the mother that preceded China, the woman we as readers are never introduced to, in fact, by any name other than Mama. And though Mama's absence is clearly a source of agony for Esh, it is the difficulty of reckoning with her ghost that serves as the foundation for Esh's connection with China, her understanding of the dog as her kin. The sense of intimacy is further complicated by a pervasive fear of losing control, of being given over to wildness that haunts Esh throughout the novel. When describing a lover, she claims that his muscles jabbered like chickens. She refers to her childhood home as a drying animal skeleton, everything inside evidence of living salvaged over the years. In the landscape Esh paints for us, there is a porousness between worlds, a commonality held between living and non-living things alike. Following Colin Diane's claim that dogs are what she calls the bridge that joins persons to things, life to death, both in our nightmares and in our daily lives, I wonder if we can think about Esh and China's relationship as just this sort of forged connectivity, a rapport beyond blood that also extends to the vast majority of person-non-person -person relations that compose their social world. What Diane calls a bridge is also, of course, a blurring, an entanglement marring of distinctions rooted in white supremacist anthropocentrism. For Esh already knows that there is an unrelenting, forced proximity between her and China, that they are both imagined, at least under the terms of civil society's flattening optics, as what I would like to think of here as low life. China, after all, is not only a dog but a pit bull, and thus always already criminalized in advance. Esh is a poor, dark-skinned black girl from the town of Bois Sauvage, Mississippi, French for wild wood, a place named outright for its utter lack of civility, its murky depths and untamed flora. Thinking about low life in its many registers not only means turning a critical eye towards sites that have historically been considered unworthy of study, but also taking seriously the various social practices that have taken hold at the level below which one cannot go immersing oneself in the infinite possibilities dreamt up and given language by the kids and the beasts and the broken things that have made a way out of no way, that have forged a kind of life underground in the blackness at the bottom of the world. The lowness of low life is intended to operate as an ongoing critique and complication of life in the upper divisions of mainstream social strata, i.e. the good life. And what's more, as a spatial description of an elsewhere in which the forms of life that are repressed subjugated and every day subdued might have room to flourish among themselves, gather in the commons outside the commons or else below it. Skeeda describes it best perhaps. He even throws in a rhyming couplet for emphasis. We savages up here on the pit, even the gnats, mosquitoes so big they look like bats. This moment of self-naming this critical embrace of savagery is one of the novel's great gifts. There is no place in the text untouched by the brutality that surrounds this community, the danger that shapes quotidian life. And given Skeeda's definition of what makes the denizens of the pit especially savage, we know that it is a designation that travels across species. Even the gnats and mosquitoes are larger than life, mutated beyond clear taxonomic boundary. As it is for China, so it goes for Esh or Skeeda. Violence and intimacy are twin edges of the same blade. To come from Bois Sauvage, to live and work in the pit, and still name one's dog China, 
is to assert a kind of beauty and value where there is said to be none. A savage beauty that is not as easily breakable as fine china, though it may bear its trays. In this vein, we might also read the name China as a marker of smoothness, a testament to the way she moves in every fight, fur and skin so slick, no other dog can get a hold of her. To be China is to be kept precious, to be well looked after and cared for. China's name is a reflection of the mutual adoration between her and Skeeta, who is never referred to as her owner, but regularly mentions her as his teammate and collaborator, the sole friend he cherishes and trains alongside. In this sense, China is representative, I think, of Fred Moten's understanding of blackness as that which often claims those who are not necessarily legible as members of the African diaspora, or even and especially, I would argue, the category of the human, but nonetheless are marked and marred by their condemnable proximity to black people, black locales. When Esch compares China to a magnolia blossom or sand, it is an attempt to insert her into a broader eco-poetics that asserts vitality where it is not readily visible, to praise the starkness of her bright white coat the way one might praise a star, only visible against the blackness which serves as its condition of perceptibility. Indeed, when one pivots from Esch's description of China's chromatic whiteness to Skeeda's during the course of a fight, we arrive at a rather striking litany of descriptors, none of which reinscribe what we might think of as a color theory delimited by the restrictions of a white supremacist imaginary. And this is directly from the text. China white, he breathes. My China, like bleach China, hitting and turning them red and white China, like coca China. So hard they breathe you up and they nose bleed. Leave them shaking, China. Make them love you, China. Make them need you. Make them know even though they want to, they can't live without you, China. My China, he mumbles. Make them know. Make them know. Make them know. China's name and her color by extension seems to signify a distinctly low series of affects. Yearning, addiction, indiscernibility, China is a force that obscures, rearranging every border and boundary, blurring inside and outside, pleasure and pain, life and death itself. And it is this indeterminacy, bodied forth in the form of a song crafted by her closest companion, that gives charge to China's color as a useful metonym for thinking against what one might normally ascribe to whiteness. Rather than imagining her coat in contrast to the wildness of Voice Sauvage, the irreducible, irredeemable blackness of its inhabitants and all that they touch, we can instead read China's whiteness as a site of intoxication and excess. Through China's flesh and the proximity to blackness she enacts in her everyday movement through the world of the pit and beyond, whiteness and blackness as markers of normative value are muddled, thrown into flux. China must make them know who she is, make them know her strength, her ferocity and skill, because of the supposed distance between what her color signifies and the world she inhabits, the shine of her coat and the dirt and grime from which she emerges. Here in the pit, the unrelenting forms of restriction that govern the lives of these children are altogether cast aside, eschewed in favor of a worldview where the partitions between forms of life come crashing down. Again, the savage here appears, not as a marker of derision or worthlessness, but as a modality defined by courage and tenacity. The savage heart is that which flourishes in the midst of the unlivable, which persists in spite of a structure set up against them from the very start. Again, it is the commonplace nature of this brutality, not only its frequency, but that it is held in common that makes all the difference. This is a violence that extends even beyond the human dog relationships in the novel as structured within the bounds of the fight and into language that serves as the condition of emergence for what we can call to riff on Giorgio Agamben, relation without rank. By novel's end, when Hurricane Katrina has ravaged the land and there is barely a home standing in Bois Sauvage, Esch will not only refer to the storm as the mother that swept into the gulf and slaughtered, but also later on as the murderous mother who cut us to the bone but left us alive, left us naked and bewildered as wrinkled newborn babies, as blind puppies, as sun-starved newly hatched baby snakes. In Salvage the Bones, motherhood is a category that is open to both the non-human and the non-living. There is a constellation of mothers, Katrina, Mama, China, and Esh, each inhabiting a different position in a constellation of biological life 
that teach us how to read salvage the bones for signs of joy and vitality where some might see only blight, a great land laid to waste. For it is in the wake of Katrina's great destruction when the debris has smashed its collective head into the homes of the dispossessed, countless shards of glass glinting like dew drops against the dead wet earth that we encounter a truly breathtaking moment of black social life somehow breaking through. And I quote, people in the street, barefoot, half naked, walking around felled trees, crumpled trampolines, talking with each other, shaking their heads, repeating one word over and over again, alive, 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 alive. Even after the end of the world then, we find that there is still an occasion for gathering. Against an order that might name these men and women and children as already long gone, there is a refusal bodied forth in the very act of speaking to one another, of returning repeatedly to that which is supposedly farthest from their reach, a life worth recognizing as such. The Katrina survivors of Boy Sauvage go as far as to turn their refusal to die into a kind of spell, a hymn that speaks life where it simply cannot be, futurity where all available metrics signal finitude, just as Esh calls us to see China as her sister in the novel's final pages, the black poor of Boy Sauvage demand that we think of life and death, abundance and utter lack, not as clearly demarcated antipodes, but as altogether inextricable, death as a species of life. For the denizens of the pit, not unlike those who inhabit the muck, the clearing, the bottom, and countless other spaces in and through which the historically marginalized have forged imposed nothingness into a kind of living, there is a flourishing that exceeds the reach and restrictions of the grave. There is a world beneath the world, and it shimmers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that I'm happy to be saying what I'm saying. It's not beautiful, uh, which I, I love beautiful, and I love to do it at times, but uh, that's not this right now. There's only going to be that beautiful, which I have around me, which I feel good about. Okay. Um, in the last and most recent email Carla sent to me about our panel, I noticed for the very first time that the panel was titled Haptic animalities. When Carla first organized this panel in mid-December, her email, I thought, had indicated that the panel was titled Haptic Animosities. <laughs> and indeed, Carla would eventually tell me that she had written haptic animosities in the email. I thought I had imagined it, but no. But since that December email, and as we were thrown into the early days of the Trump administration, I simply continued to think we would be speaking today about animosities, and I continued to mull over in my mind what I might say about affect and the Trump administration. Given the work being done, especially the work being done on race and sexuality in relationship to animalities, it still seems possible to fruitfully exploit the slippage between animalities and animosities as the privileging of one species over another or the human over the non-human, including non-human animals, is not only infused with racial sexual hierarchies or animosities, but also this kind of privileging of the human continues to be deployed in what Jespier Puar has called inhuman biopolitics, a term, and I hope we'll hear about it maybe, a term she uses in relationship to what she has described as maiming, or as she has put it, not letting die or keeping alive in debilitated conditions of body and environment. So I'm setting up a tension here between human and non-human and inhuman. I also want to turn to Catherine Malibu's description of what she calls extreme relational violence that undoes the distinction 
between organic trauma and sociopolitical trauma. As Malibu explains, explains it, those traumatized by war, captivity, occupation, or sexual abuse show similar behavior to those suffering brain lesions. That is, they are affected neurobiologically. By no means reducing these traumas to a simple neurology or neurobiology, Malibu has suggested that these traumas be understood to be psychic blows, stripped of all justification, of all signification, such that the victim's very selfhood is transformed. We might say they are relationally and humanly transformed, if not at times debilitated. What is interesting here is that we can speak of the debilitation of the victim. We can witness the debilitation of the victim, of ourselves as victims, without it being a matter of blaming the victim or defining the victim as non-human or reduced to animality. We can do this because of the work being done on animality, race, and sexuality. Because this work, we can do this because this work demands that we carefully tread the fine line between inhuman biopolitics and the proper recognition of other than human animacies, such as the animacies of non-human animals, but also stone or metal about which Mel Chen has written and which in my own work I have also developed as the effective capacities of matter, or what more recently has been referred to as the worldly sensibility of the environment itself, brought to us with all sorts of tracking and sensing technologies. Deadly technologies as these may be, they are technologies that also play a large part in deprivileging or decentering human consciousness and cognition, revealing the agency of the environment itself prior to human cognition, human consciousness, even human affect. The world around us is, so to speak, pre-affecting our affectivity or our sensibilities. Again, we are asked to tread a fine line between inhuman biopolitics informed by a neoliberal capitalism and invested with various biopolitical aims that will exploit the liveliness of everything and a recognition of other than human agencies or other than human affectivity. In this light, I want to say that I earlier mentioned Malibu because affect in the early days of its career as a concept was defined as a non-conscious, non-cognitive bodily capacity or receptivity connected to the autonomic nervous system and was recognized as such because in response to a given stimulus, brain activity could be seen to occur a half a second before consciousness of that stimulus. So the body felt before the subject knew that it felt mm -hmm. or what it felt before it became conscious. While philosophically speaking, this means that affect is an indeterminacy that precedes and exceeds consciousness, cognition, rationality, and of course, determination itself. So we can only be conscious of affect or materialize it and manipulate it through a technical expansion, which can be a narrative, poetry, and through digital media, such as with the digital media that allowed neurobiological brain imaging that displayed the half minute delay we call affect. Malibu makes this clear when she says there is no neurobiology that isn't technological. I am interested in arguing 
that the distinction between human and non-human animal, which we are deconstructing on this panel, is on the other side of the distinction of human and technology, as uh, Carla mentioned, which also must be deconstructed in terms of what Jacques Derrida first called an originary technicity, meaning neither nature nor technicity is originary. Neither human or non-human are originary, or they both are. It is an undecidable. It is an indeterminacy. It is a potentiality. What this means for affect is that affect is neither merely biological, it is a force of indeterminacy, a passage in time from the biological to the worldly, in a half a second actually, it is a medium or the indeterminacy of technicity. Affect is the potential of a technical expansion. We can see this with in human biopolitics where the technologies of maiming are working at the level of affective time as an effort to control the timing of affect debilitating or expanding affective capacity, not just in the human, but all the way through environment and matter. But this is not, as bad as that is, this is not a fall from nature into technology, but a certain realization of originary technicity, a struggle between the determinacy of digital technologies and their indeterminacy of affect none of which is outside technicity, artificiality. Again, this is important to recognize, otherwise our deconstruction of the opposition of animality and humanity will only be partial. We must also deconstruct the distinction between technicity and nature, technicity and the human. And as I began with the work of critical theorists working on race, sexuality, and animality, I would point here to Denise Ferreira de Silva's critique of determinacy as she takes blackness to be the force of indeterminacy in a white privileged male oriented thought while remembering that blackness is not merely black people, as we heard, as Fred Moten would put it. Keeping this in mind, I want to speak about the difference between affect and the haptic or at least say a word on touch and being touched, because I'm especially interested in the place of touch in revealing that skin is an originary technicity for the human infant and maybe not just the human infant. As a number of psychoanalysts have argued, the babies touching themselves and feeling their being touched by themselves creates the skin as a medium to experience the gap of time between touch and touched, the passage of time between touched and being touched. The skin as a first medium is an originary technicity that allows for a sense of an inside containment and an outside environment and the ability to cross over as a matter of time, effective time. Touch and affect are very much related here, but affect is the very time of crossing. Affect is like a temporal infrastructure of touch and of all the other senses, of all feeling. It is an infrastructure of all sensual mediation. Affect gives the body the capacity to cross species, to cross distinction of human and non-human, inside and outside, that is what affect affords through the originary technicity of the skin, which denaturalizes the human body as well as the skin, not in terms of a cultural argument, say the cultural arguments about skin color, but more in terms of recognizing skin as medium, allowing species crossing or crossing to the worldly sensibility of the environment itself. And the world touches back, creating a sensible commons that isn't simply a common sense. 
While black bodies, as well as bodies of color, debilitated bodies, have been reduced to animality or non-humanness, blackness reinstates the force of indeterminacy or the capacity to cross, to cross the oppositions of human and non-human, including the opposition of non-human animality and human. The capacity to cross. I would argue that all this changes what media are today and how this issue of fake news or lying is but one, however, serious symptom of a much larger problem of seeing what the turn to affect has done to determination, to measure, to science, to observation, it can, just goes on and on, and what it has done to blackness. That is to say, it has made determination only part of the larger force of indetermination. I would end with Trump and less about his effective appeals or his repulsions, his animosities. I would instead point to his unfettered capacity to block the mediations of affect by jamming mediation, trying to block all crossings. Thank you. Thanks, Patricia, and thank you uh, for inviting me um, and for being here today. Um, I feel like I could have picked many parts to read from my forthcoming book, and now I feel like I picked the most boring part um, after hearing Patricia, so I apologize for that. Um, the book is called The Right to Maim, Debility, Capacity, Disability, and will be out in October. Um, and it does try to bring together conversations about uh, what the unhuman is, um, debility, disability, and also uh, biopolitical racialization. So I'm going to read this, uh, a section here called Posthuman Subalterns. This book foregrounds an intervention into the fields of posthumanism, object-oriented ontology, and new materialisms, insisting on an analysis of the subhuman or not quite human along with the cyborgian and the posthuman. Convinced it is utterly crucial not to leave these fields left alone to play in their unraced genealogies. Critics of these fields have interrogated the relation between objects and objectification and how and why certain objects get to be subjects while others remain objectified and or commodified. For example, Fred Moten on the paraontology of the commodity in, on, in contrast to the flat ontology centered by object-oriented ontologists where everything is level. And just to note that, um, that Moten wrote that particular uh, prescient critique in, I think, 2003. Mel Chen's work emphasizes the pros and cons of investing in notions of vibrant matter without concomitant attention to the material conditions of the production of that matter, not to mention deracinated and desexualized notions of vibrancy and agency. Disability theories and theorists in general have much fodder for challenging object-oriented ontologies, rarely having had the privilege of taking objects and human relations to them for granted. So for example, Anjan Kim writes, quote, instead of defending the fraught definition of human as the basis of a moral and caring world in order to valorize disabled ex existence, I suggest recognizing the intercorporeal ontology of objects with the aim not of conferring inherent rights on them, but rather of undermining efforts to deny a being humanist on the basis of object-like status, end quote. So bodies understood as disabled, particularly cognitively disabled, have often been cast as inert passive objects rather than human subjects through a projection of degraded objecthood elevated over qualified personhood. Thus, the mere status of objecthood itself cannot revitalize our relations to objects as would be the approach of object-oriented ontology. Instead, our attitudes toward objects need to be reevaluated. In other words, objects are vaunted unless they are humans who are considered objects, such as slaves and vegetables. 
This recognition in turn has challenged the status of rational, agential, survivor-oriented politics based on the privileging of language capacity to make rights claims. Because the inability to quote unquote communicate functions as a singular determinant of mental or cognitive impairment, thereby regulating the human-animal distinction as well as the distinction between humans and objects and destabilizing the centrality of the human capacity for thought and cognition. cognition. So as uh, philosopher Eva Kate states in regard to her co cognitively disabled daughter, what would it mean to let go of the privileging of the life of the mind? Despite the fact that language is multiple, it has been reduced to a singularly human capacity that we might want to make distinguish, distin distinctions between linguistic domains, the province of many non-human animals, unlike language proper. Not only is language the primary or even defining attribute that separates humans from animals, but as Mel Chen writes, the ling quote, the linguistic criteria are established prominently and immutably in human terms, establishing human preeminence before the debates about linguistic placement of humans, animal subordination even begins, end quote. And I think it's important to note that following uh, Jacques Derrida, that the distinction is differently articulated in different eras and areas of knowledge. So variously as one of sentience, of capacity to feel pain, and of subjective capacity. There are two interventions that Chen is making here. First, the understanding of language as running across species rather than articulating a human, non-human animal divide. And secondly, destabilizing what is often called the primacy of language, interrogating the place of language itself. In doing so, we not only open up the question of what language is, but we can also resituate language as one intensification of a bodily capacity, one manner of many that the body can articulate itself, one platform out of many through which politics can enunciate, and finally, one kind of matter among many matters. In an effort to open up capacity as a source of generative affective politics, rather than only a closure around neoliberal demands, I would briefly like to return to Guy Three Spivak's Can the Subaltern Speak? And I've written here per per perhaps unfashionably so, and this essay means so much to me, <laughs> um, but I've noticed uh, that it hasn't, um, uh, that it, has, it hasn't been uh, talked about in quite some time, at least in a, in a, in a, a, a different way than it's been talked about for a long time. Um, in the context of debility and disability, can the subaltern speak becomes not only a mandate for epistemological correctives, but a query regarding ontological and bodily capacity, as granting voice to the subaltern comes into tension with the need, and in the case of human, non-human animal distinction, to destabilize privileged modes of communication, representation, and language altogether. For Spivak, what she calls subaltern consciousness is a theoretical fiction. Representation, both Darstellen and Vertraten, is an anthropocentric demand and a philosophical and political privilege of the human, and always already over-representation in Sylvia Winter's terms. Spivak's own ambivalence towards representation as an anthropocentric demand and the philosophical privilege of the human surfaces momentarily, most significantly in the section discussing Sigmund Freud's seminal essay, A Child is Being Beaten. Here I discern two realms where the dominance of language as distinctly an exceptional human attribute remains yet to be established. The first, further drawing on psychoanalysis, is the pre-linguistic -lingu realm of the child, where the analyst has to speak for the child, giving voice to and for the child. There's a par paradox here of the speaker who cannot speak, or the child is not yet a speaking subject, and therefore not a subject. Spivak graphs onto the, quote, dangers run by Freud's discourse, um, another sentence that fumbles with what she calls our efforts to give the subaltern a voice in history. And this sentence is white men are saving brown women from brown men. The second realm is where Spivak's impulse to push back against humanism appears in a reference to the archaic past, where she writes, 
this is part of a history of repression of a pre-originary space where human and animal were not yet differentiated, end quote. So there's two moments. One is about a positioning in a, a particular kind of constellation or triangulation, and the other is about the becoming of the subject. It remains unclear to me whether for Spivak the problem is the epistemic enclosure through which a subaltern is stuck in a closed system, or if representation itself is the problem in which case she might ultimately be more aligned with Deleuze's and Foucault's project than she originally might have thought. Is she interested in saving the subject or is she already diagnosing the political impasse of representation? In that speech, a normative function of humanist politics is seemingly foreclosed for Spivak. In relation to this normative function, the subaltern, as she writes several times, is mute. Um, and the language of capacity and uh, debility are uh, rampant throughout this entire essay. In relation to this normative function, uh, sorry, the invocation of conditions of disability is crucial here, as Spivak, in effect, is making an argument about the debilitating conditions of contemporary political, intellectual, and epistemological practices. Undoing these knots between representation and language has asked me to question why the subaltern is usually assumed to be necessarily human. If subalternity is by definition a relation of the un or non or subhuman that are excluded from dominant systems of circulation, deemed unfit for recognition or unable to be recognized, the subaltern then could be generously rethought as a non-human or inhuman configuration. In Spivak's schema, woman is a potential, as a potential subaltern cannot simply be added to the list of pious items slated for rescue, remedied through an epistemological corrective. By extension, neither can species or non-human animals or even people with disabilities. In my talking of this field-defying essay, the subaltern cannot speak because of the human, non-human animal divide that dictates that speech always shows up in an anthropocentric and thus ableist form. Subaltern cannot speak nor be heard within logocentric and thus ableist frames of legibility. Further to my project, which is interested in challenging geopolitically uninflected theorizations of posthumanism, I follow Sylvia Winter's formulation of the human as representationally overdetermined by one genre of human through the ongoing restoration of humanism. Um, via the individual, despite the force of biopolitical population construction. For Winter, the project of a radical humanism has yet to be begun, much less left behind for posthumanist waters. Her project is thus not one of demanding inclusion as human, and therefore does not reassert the frames of temporality, progression, or priority. Rather, she insists on the multiplicity of humans and human forms that have yet to be known a revolutionary humanism with deep commitments to those entities that are instrumentally denied humanity in order for it to be sustained. Reading Spivak and Winter together reveals the speaking subject of politics and history is a genre of the human that the subaltern defies, populated by inhuman entities as well as humans produced as objects, as property, as animals, as subhumans unworthy of political consideration. The ability to cognate language is also where human, non-human animal distinctions, as well as human technology distinctions, have long been drawn. And here, disability studies, posthumanism, and critical animal studies may articulate a common interest in a non-anthropomorphic interspecies vision of affective politics. While disability studies has diligently refuted the negative slurs with animality unleashed against those with cognitive and mental disabilities, it has at times, according to Sonara Taylor, unwittingly reinforced a privileging of the human in doing so. Noting that disability activists argue for rights for those disabled who are, quote, lacking certain highly valued abilities like rationality and physical independence, end quote. She then asks, quote, how can disability studies legitimately exclude animals for these reasons without contradiction? 
I argue that disability studies has accidentally created a framework of justice that can no longer exclude other species, end quote. The burgeoning field of critical animal studies is thus also a part of this endeavor to situate human capacities within a range of capacities of species as opposed to reifying their singularity. In line with Taylor's critique then, it is also necessarily a site, as we've been all talking about, where a persistent examination of the entwinement of race and animality cannot be elided. It, however, can also be the case that the post-human, as Alex Wahelia notes, quote, frequently appears as little more than the white liberal subject in techno-informational guise, end quote. And then on the other hand, you have um, disability studies theorist Dan Goodley, who argues for a post-human disability studies because he writes, disabled bodies epitomize the ethical reaches of post-humanist discourses. Um, so this is interesting to me, I think, because even as we push back on this kind of runaway uptake of post-humanist um, theory, it, uh, it is another challenge to actually take up um, disabled bodies as post-humanist bodies. Um, and yet then, uh, again, as Patricia was recapping, the kind of dominant notion of disability um, is still tarrying between uh, the human-non-human -human animal divide uh, and does not address this kind of third configuration of the inhuman, um, which is, again, a, a part that I didn't bring today that I regret not bringing. Anyway. Um, Provocatively suggesting that perhaps the posthuman is not a temporal location, but a geographic one, Zakia Aman Jackson asks, quote, might there be a posthumanism that does not privilege European man and its idiom? It is possible that the very subjects central to posthumanist inquiry, the binarisms of human animal, nature culture, animate inanimate, organic inorganic, find their relief outside of the epistemological locus of the West. If, according to posthumanist thinkers, such as Manuel Delanda and Karen Barad, language has been granted too much power, non-anthropomorphic conceptions of humans, that is a conception of the human that anthropomorphizes itself, perhaps linked to what Winter hails as the overrepresentation of the white man, are necessary to resituate language as one of many captures of the intensities of bodily capacities, an event of bodily assemblages rather than a performative act of signification. Thank you. In your defense, um, I, I know from working on this conference that animalities corrects to animosities. Yes, that's why. <laughs> And so, so that's how we ended oh, up with you. Yes, <laughs> it, it, ha kept, it happened over and over again to me. I kept having to go back and, fi and fix it. But of course, it made me think about the conjunctions that you were talking about, especially given our hideous political moment. Um, so I want to th thank you, for, I don't know, for working with that accident. <laughs> um, but I actually had a question. <laughs> yeah. um, I had a question, sort of a question. I don't know, a, a, a thinking together kind of intervention for you, Joshua, um, which is, so the white dog is a, ultimately a black dog, right? But the white dog's name is China. And it sounded from the, the passage that you quoted as if China was only rift in one direction, right? So only towards um, dishes, dishware, porcelain, that kind of, that end. But I kept thinking about China. I don't know, I kept, and, and wondering whether or not that there was resonance around um, the, the label China as somehow exotic, other, and so, so appropriate to this white dog that was a black dog. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. There's something funny going on there. Yeah, yeah. Or China is, is potentially distant, right? Like for these kids that don't necessarily ever get to leave the town, right? China becomes this gesture towards some other land, um, <clears throat> which I think is ultimately what's happening too in the the riff for China is fine China or a delicacy. Yeah, I mean, I don't think of, how to say this? I think of China as a dog that is black end, right? Like for me, the, the way I'm thinking about Fred, and it's so interesting too, I just want to point out how sort of black studies looms large on the panel. I found that fascinating. Like yeah. Winter, Moten, Zakia Jackson's work comes up. And, and for me, part of it is that um, 
there are animals, both that are phenotypically black, like black dogs or black cats that are seen as unlucky, right? Black dogs that have a harder time getting adopted. But I'm also interested in, in animal species like, uh, animals like pit bulls, right, that are blackened by association, <laughs> right? That mostly by having sort of black and Latinx owners are seen as especially vicious, right? They said their jaws are more powerful. And these aren't rooted in any sort of scientific inquiry, right? It's just this uh, fraught adjacency, this proximity. So I, I think in that way, I'm trying to think about China as one of the few white dogs in the black aesthetic tradition that is being riffed in that direction, right? Because for Langston Hughes, the white dog is a marker, sort of a whiteness as loneliness, right? Like Miss Briggs is this white woman that sees her black janitor every day and wants to talk to him and never does, right? And it's just her and her little dog uh, flips, right? And she just sits with her dog, right? And in all these other instances, the white dog, I think, is doing very different semiotic work than what's happening um, in the war text. And I think she's calling on that archive. Um, which is part of why I'm interested in the sort of black and white dog um, that's cutting in both ways at the same time. Thank you guys for all of those beautiful presentations. A question about um, sort of this anthropomorphizing of humanness. I've been trying to consider the locked-in syndrome body and how do we conceive of a person that cannot communicate or move in any way yet is still a being, yet is still alive, and according to science, may even be happy to be alive. Um, and then considering also a person who decides to preserve themselves after death, and how by wanting to be preserved for a future afterlife, considers themselves a being as well. How, does, how do we kind of theorize that with even this third um, in human category, I, I, I'm lost, I'm, I'm struggling. And just briefly, uh, opacity is, is a very useful uh, sort of way for me to think about these things, right? So whether or not one has any sort of ready access to another uh, being's modality, lived experiences, right, um, outside of the province of language, I think one can still honor that position as a position, if that makes sense, right? So uh, Zora Neale Hurston helps me think about this um, with uh, the mule funeral. Right, uh, and their eyes are watching God. Right, this idea that the mule dies as a natural man, the buzzards have a funeral for the the mule. Right, there's this idea that animals have a world that is entirely opaque, right, um, to human beings. Right, and that that's sort of the only way it is. That kind of the myth of whiteness is that we can know animals and like we understand animals very deeply, um, much the same way we understand racialize others and their wants. Right, and I think in the the, the figure you sort of provided, opacity is still a, a useful way of, of thinking about that, right? What are the worlds that are foreclosed to us? Um, and what is ethically important about that foreclosure, right? And, and what motivates the desire to, to know another um, and have them be fully uh, available to you, right? Sometimes it's love, right? But sometimes also I think we need to uh, question that motivation or put pressure on it. You know, I would say that it also brings up this issue that I'm really concerned about. What determines, what is the measure by which we determine life or beyond life, or um, that has really opened up in, in, um, in our thoughts. And it, it's quite disabling, um, <laughs> disabling. It is also dis uh, disturbing, but really interesting. So I was thinking um, to get back to, not right this minute, but about the relationship of violence to how we might uh, think in terms of ways to be critical, given we've opened up what determination is. You know, we used to use determination to decide things. You know, this is life, this is, and then we could do ethics and morality. But when that's more mobile and more open and the indeterminate becomes more interesting actually than the determinant, we will have to think of other ways to, to approach, um, uh, you know, I would say issues of violence, probably. I guess I would want to say that um, the fields of disability studies and also biopolitics has been working with these questions for a long time. So, or, or at least the study of debilitation that runs across both those fields have been thinking about this stuff for a long time. So one of the things I've been following is what's happening in Palestine, which is the refusal to return 
um, the bodies of killed Palestinians to their families so that they can be properly buried. And, and so I would just want to say that I think part, part of what I try to do in this book is, is think about biopolitics that's not a frame hinging on the poles of living and dying. Um, and so for me, and, and Patricia kind of drew this out of my work more than it's actually in there, so I have to take a look at your paper. Um, but it's really about the will not let die and how that becomes a kind of distinct configuration, um, both an aim and an effect of biopolitics unto itself. It's not a modulation of living and dying. So, um, and so I, th I think, I, th I would argue that the way that many, many biopolitical thinkers have been working is through the liberalization of these different kinds of forms of um, being by sticking to the living dying pole, right? And not being able to articulate um, other spaces, spaces of occupation, colonialism, settler colonialism, where living and dying no longer are, um, or are not the only operative poles, but obviously many things happening before and after. And I think this really, for example, the debates between, um, the debates around uh, dignified dying, right, or dignified death, um, something of what you were talking about, and then the kind of, um, the way biopolitics holds on to bodies that are already quote unquote dead, right? What is the meaning? What is the meaning of that? Right? Why won't these bodies be returned to the West Bank? Um, so these are all different ways that I think these questions have already um, been around for quite some time. But because biopolitics demands a kind of living, dying articulation, um, that uh, we need to keep disrupting. What I think is a is actually just a an assumption, a liberal assumption about the value of living and the value of dying. Something your question also made me think about is, um, well, because this conference is so much about touch that, um, if I'm not mistaken, locked-in syndrome doesn't exclude um, the reception of sensation. And therefore, there is a way that um, non let's call it non-expressive uh, uh, communication, um, doesn't have to rule out sociality. Um, it does put into question some of the way we legislate these days, questions of consent, because of course, if you have a version of non-expressive sociality, then, then it really doesn't fit into the discourse of consent in some of the ways that we traditionally understand those discourses. But to me, what that suggests is we need a more capacious and more complicated way to think about sociality than the, um, the kind of bottom line, uh, reductivist, legal, you know, um, did you like that touch kind of thing. And, and I believe there are ways. It's just, I'm not sure. I mean, I don't think we've invented a rich world for them yet. Thanks. I just wanted to ask um, a, a follow-up question to Joshua. Thank you so much for your presentation. Maybe Carla would want to jump in. I'm not sure. But I'm interested in the privileging of the dog in many discussions of human-animal relations. And I think your your paper begins to explain to me why we do, but you you suggested that you know one would want to investigate whether there could be a non-sovereign and non-hierarchical relationship between the human and the animal. And I think that maybe, but one can't get that through the dog, because the dog's you, you know main appeal to people is, and the reason that you know the person says that this is my friend is precisely because a dog is trainable and obedient in a way that most other animals are not. So I, I'd love to, you know, and I wonder if that, that comes out in Colin Diane's book. I just started it, but I felt like a, a lot of books about dogs are deeply romantic about the relationship with dog, dogs when in fact it is a kind of um, idealization of the human that comes out of the relationship to the dog, uh, a, a deep reinvestment in the human, 
Um, and so to, to, to follow the track that you're following where we, we see the whiteness of the dog already, the weaponization of the dog already feels absolutely the way to go. And I felt like your paper was, was going there and then pulling back a little bit and I wanted to just push you to keep going. Almost contra Haraway, who has a romance with the dog too. So when she stops talking about monkeys and starts talking about dogs, we s sort of enter into a human-centric world again, despite the claim for a, a species companionship. So, you know, I don't know if, if, if you can respond to that. Yeah, absolutely, thank, thank you, you for that, it's very useful. Definitely get the book, because I kind of go in the direction you're gesturing toward um, in that last chapter, in part because there are moments where China does not disobey. Right, or does not obey, rather, where China not only turns uh, on her own puppies, but turns on Skeeta, right? Sometimes in moments of tremendous tenderness, uh, where Skeeta is washing her or trying to show affection, and China absolutely rebels. And so part of what I'm trying to think through, particularly with China, but also with all these other dogs, right? What are dogs that act outside the bounds of the civil? And, and Colin does get into this in their, their most recent book, With Dogs at the Edge of Life, right? What are the dogs that are wild dogs that have to be killed? Right? and what dogs have wildness sort of cathected onto them because of their proximity to racialized others. But also I do share your concern about the dog as a figure that looms large in this regard. And so part of what I'm trying to do in the book project as well is move from the pet to the pest um, in this regard, right? So thinking about human-animal relationships that aren't predicated upon sovereign power um, and through the writing of Audre Lorde, Lucille Clifton, uh, black women poets who write about pests in these really compelling ways, right? Gwendolyn Brooks and the mouse, right? Because you can kill one, but they're legion, right? Um, and some, you know, uh, Lucille Clifton has this beautiful poem, The Beginning of the End of the World, where the, the roaches stand like priests, yeah. right? And, and watch them in judgment. They judge the humans, right? Because they will inherit the world, right? Not just the meek, but the unkillable, right? So, so for me, uh, that, that critique of sovereignty really does come out in, uh, in black eco-poetics and the way they turn to uh, both pests, but also animals that are our property, right? So I'll, I'll close with that, thinking about Douglas and uh, the oxen that drag him through, through the forest, right? And then he's punished when he gets back to the plantation um, because the oxen are seen as more valuable than he is, right? So I'm also trying to map those more unwieldy relations too. There's some of, in, in your talk, and I, I missed a little bit, but about violence. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm oh, no, did you? Is it okay? a question about the source. Oh, okay, the source. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, about the roaches? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so hard to compete with the roach, uh, but I'm, I must. <laughs> so, um, the violence. You know, I think there's violence for all of us to think about, and the sociality question. You know, I'm a sociologist, and it's just amazing to me how, how much we've thought about the subject and deconstructing the subject. I don't think we've done similar work about sociality. I mean, uh, you know, about what does the term mean or what is society? I mean, in terms of those are very human organizational, uh, you know, we usually think of human, I know there are other kinds of societies, but the way we think of human population society is still very interesting to me. Um, about these deconstructions around violence as well. Like there, there's something about the violence when you did the pest that almost says, we liked it, we all liked it, but what if they were humans being, I mean, I'm not being very clear, but I, I think we need a sort of new thinking about violence. I, I just wanted to add your I mean, your critique is well taken and, of course, taken up as well. I mean, everyone's concerned about how pets are, are the stand-in for our new convivial, you know, Anthropocene, blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I guess I would just point out disability studies, again, has um, had to literalize the understanding of dogs as human prosthetic, yeah. right? So, um, so there are ways in which that romanticization is... Is already being is already constantly broken down, yeah. and also oh, and also just thinking about that and its ties to mass incarceration, right? So thinking about this New York Times article from about three years ago about incarcerated men that are made to care for dogs that become care dogs that are purchased, you know, for tens of thousands of dollars, right? So this sort of liberal moment and the, the use of dogs and those intersections that we need to be vigilant about. I was wondering uh, as well uh, for uh, Joshua, but as well the others, I was thinking a lot about rhythm and tone 
And uh, in terms of you're talking about something unkillable, un unkillable, what cannot be killed, and then you finish with a, a world beneath the world that shivers. And so I was uh, wondering, when you were reading, there was something about the uh, a power in the tone and in the voice, and I was also thinking how much I want to return to your text. But then I thought, if I read it tomorrow in the afternoon, it will not have the sound. <laughs> so I thought about the something about the power of the of the living voice and tone, and if you have something to say in relation to the what seems to me Im super important about rhythm in terms of that unkillability or in terms of that shivering. Oh, thank you, Juan. That makes me feel great. I'm a poet by trade, so it's great to hear that some of that is still there. I mean, the rhythm lives on, I guess, is one thing that I think of, right? That sort of one of the, the markers of the unkillability of, of, of black sociality are, are, is the music um, that we have left. But also thinking about, my good friend Jamal is here. So thinking about listening to DMX. Sorry, I started with a, a DMX epigraph. Listening to DMX as a child. I'm from Yonkers, and DMX is from Yonkers. Woo woo, claim to fame. And um, thinking about his barks and his prayers and how those were almost inextricable on wax, right? Like the sound of the animal sound, the holy petition, um, and this, this undeniably powerful voice, this undeniable rhythm. I was interested in that, and that really called to me and, and pulled me into a different way of thinking relation um, at a very young age. I think rhythm is everything. I think sound is sort of inextricable from sense. Um, I think it's important that we always commit to the music. And I think for someone like Jasmine Ward, right, the, the author, um, that's of central importance, right, the, the role of music in, in making life, I guess, that which is worth living. And also, language is not reducible to, um, or sorry, rather, music's not reducible to language, and this is Nietzsche, right, that he says we get song from the birds, right, um, is that it's, it's humans mimicking how birds communicate. So. And I, I would add that rhythmicity is um, central to my thinking of matter as being alive. I'm thinking of whitehead and rhythmicity and, um, yeah, just the, the tone and the sound of, yeah, yeah, yeah. of non-human tones. I mean, other than human tones and sounds and rhythmicity is, is a whole kind of sociality in a sense, right? Um, it can okay. be violent too. Uh, we have to stop now to, for the next panel. And um, thank you all for your questions, and let's thank the panelists again. Thank you.